I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm the executive director of All Brains Belong. Welcome to Brain Club. Share screen. Here we go. Tonight, we're going to be talking about unlearning the myths of independence. Because this month at Brain Club, we're kicking off our new theme on interdependence, um, the idea of being connected to other people and interrelying on other people. And we'll, I'll give you a tour of what's ahead this month. Um, but first, what is Brain Club? It's our education space about neurodiversity and topics related to inclusive community. A reminder, this is for education purposes only, not a support group, not for medical or mental health advice. And all forms of participation are okay here. Um, video on or off, even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. Feel free to do what needs doing in whatever way you are most comfortable. And you can communicate however you're most comfortable on mute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat. And it's really important to us that we affirm all aspects of identity and respect and protect the group's collective access needs. Um, uh, Sarah, can you say can you say hello? Can you wave? This is Sarah Wilkins, our community programs coordinator. Hi. Direct messaging is enabled. So if you're uncomfortable for any reason, um, if you could send a uh, private message to Sarah, um, Sarah will see it faster than I will while I'm in shared screen mode. Okay. Um, I, I, I think this is, we're, we're ready to move past. All right, so um, last bit of access. So um, closed captions enabled, just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, either the live transcript closed captioning link or the more dot, 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 show subtitles or hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. Chat box, speech bubble. I'm going to, that's a, that, I, I always have this up as like my visual support to remind myself to open it so I will actually see if people are using it. All right. So as I said, our monthly theme for August, interdependence. And so various aspects of the collective learning and unlearning um, that we do here at Brain Club um, around uh, what what community looks like and how how we exist in community um, interrelated with other people and all of the um, the complications that are involved in um, achieving interdependent community. Um, one thing I'm just gonna say because I'm really excited about this. Um, uh, um, save the date for August 29th, our book chat this month, The Rainbow Brain by Sandhya Menon. Um, we actually uh, were uh, fortunate enough to be able to hire Sandhya to present because of the time difference. Um, uh, she's in Australia. Um, uh, it's a, it's a pre-recorded um, asynchronous presentation, but I interviewed her a couple months ago, um, a couple months ago, a couple of weeks ago, um, and it's amazing. And um, anyway, so she's reading her own book for us on the 29th. So save guest author. Yes. So cool. So cool. So anyway, here we go. I'm learning the myths of independence. Um, I'm, I'm going to try something um, We've never really done before. Um, I, I like pulled these kind of ridiculous video clips. They are they're like ridiculous on purpose. So I'm I'm uh, just bear with me. And we were having some technical glitchiness um, a little while ago, so maybe they won't even work. We'll see. Um, the idea was to try to capture um, messages, these common messages. Steve, Steve says, how do you know I need these particular topics right now? It's because we all need these particular topics now. It's like at all times we need these things. So I'm so glad. I'm so glad you're here. I'm independent. Oh, the sound is glitchy. Yes, I'm independent. Yes, I am. I can do it. All right. I think you get the point, right? Like, um, so I think like 
this is so rewarded, you know, work real hard, make a lot of friends. Um, I, I can do the thing. I'm responsible. I can focus. I can do it myself. Like this message is so out there. Um, or, and, 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 you know, when you really think about it, this starts really early. We'll see if this video works any better. Yeah. And as Steve says, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Right. Exactly. That's how fast kids seem to grow up. At what age, though, are they considered grown up enough to start being independent? And what are some things you can do to help encourage your little ones to become more independent? We're going to dive into the topic of independence in this video. But before we do, do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more parenting videos like this. First of all, let's explore the benefits of introducing independence at an early age. One of the most important benefits is that it allows children to learn how to do things for themselves, which serves as a great foundation. It teaches them that they can accomplish tasks without help, and this builds their self-confidence. Self-independence also prepares children for the challenges of life they might face later on, such as moving away from home and living. All right, have we seen enough? So, yeah, right, exactly. Um, so uh, I'm, yeah, right, still working on that because it's a myth. That's exactly right, Steve, it's a myth. It's not a thing. Um, and so uh, last, last, last clip. We can do things for ourselves. We've learned to be resourceful and creative over the years. And independence is one of those qualities that we that we treasure. It's perhaps even something that has been nurtured since we were young children. And we do. We you know we t tell children to be independent. You know, do things by yourself. Now go walk. You know, to take your bike and go around the block. It's okay now. You can go to a movie by yourself. And these sort of extra additional benefits are kind of, kind of seen as a value. Uh, reward for independence, doing things on your own. And I, you know, I think that's a good quality. I mean, it, it teaches us to be strong and, um, and re resilient. But I wonder if in some ways, we have become too focused on independence, and not enough focus on interdependence, how we're all connected. And I think one of the one of the great um, benefits of the of the situation we're facing with the with the with this pandemic, and it's not you know there's not many benefits, but one is that we're learning how to see how we're connected to each other because we've been put in situations where we cannot get together, we cannot um, you know socialize. We realize now how much we do depend on other people. And not just on people, it, it goes way beyond that. And one of our bloggers, Riley Gibson, wrote this article is called all right, I think we get the concept there too. So I I I wonder um, for someone to read Sarah's comment, unlike that video saying independence prepares them for life challenges, I feel like it prepares them for a life of trying to handle everything on your own um, and not reach out for help when they need it. Not a message I want to send to my kids. Yep. Yes, exactly. So I I I wonder. Um, I just I, I I just wonder what what reactions or thoughts are coming up for anyone so far around narratives of independence um, that 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 maybe you you you've grown up with or that you've you you see out there in the world. I think there's so many different kinds of messages that we get. Um, and sometimes it's very, I mean, especially here, it's very cultural, but um, I think there are some kinds of guidance that we provide that are helpful and not. I think the worst one is being the emotional independence that is being promoted. Like emotional independence can be such a toxic thing um, because we end up like negating our own needs in that. And I think that's one of the most critical things that we can give to our children, especially and each other, um, 
Yeah, I, you know, it's not really talked about, but I think that's one of the things that should be discussed when we talk about interdependent interdependence. Thank you, Christina. And I think, you know, connected to that, like the idea that, um, you know, already at toddlerhood, people are talking about self-regulation skills. People of all ages, including me, um, I need other nervous systems to co-regulate like a lot of the day. Um, that's just normal. Anyone else have thoughts about narratives of, of independence? I remember, um, well, it's still very much part of my life now, but it was always the, just figure it out. Just figure it out and you can do this and everyone else is struggling, but you know, you have to do like, it's, it was not a choice. It, you know, you, you can, you can figure it out and it's, <laughs> I'm still figuring it out. What, what are you talking about? Totally. That resonates with me a lot, Cynthia. And I think, I think, um, like with anything else, I think about those like early messages that get so hardwired and, you know, they're, they're, they're common. They're really common. And so, you know, if somebody grows up be, having been told, you know, you just figure it out, you know, you just do the thing. Um, because that's what they were taught as little kids. And it just, you know, it's intergenerationally um, leading to, to I, I think, really bad impact on mental health for so many of us. Um, when, you know, yeah, we, we can figure it out. We can do the thing a lot of the time at a cost, at a cost of that internalized, um, uh, like internalized ableism. We'll talk more about that. And, uh, I think it's next week or the week after that's the topic of brain club. Um, but it's, um, it's just the invalidation. And I see, a, see a, several, several of you are, are commenting about, uh, gaslighting in the chat. Exactly. Um, and Elizabeth says, linked with ideas of independence, I think of the messages that all the elders have internalized, which is, quote, not be a burden. Um, and I always feel like feeling like a burden is such a gross uh, 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 per, uh, per, uh, perversion of how you feel about yourself and how one gives and receives love. I just want to stay with that. Yes. Yes. Right. Because if you did not think that you were supposed to be connected to and depend on other humans, if that wasn't the premise, um, does that put you at increased risk of thinking that having needs makes you a burden? And then the all of the impacts of that, that premise. And I think, I, I, I think, um, yeah, I forgot what I was going to say. Steve says, um, I'm struggling with needing to ask my wife how I did in social situations because I just can't tell, right? There's so many of us who have grown up um, having a social situation and then afterwards getting feedback that like something happened and that was not the way we perceived it or um, receive the message that there's like, you know, a right way to have been in that social situation and that's not how we did it. Um, there's all these like levels of what, what leads to that. Um, but, um, you know, uh, quote, if I tried to be independent, I beat the crap of myself at 3 a.m., right? It's this, you know, rumination of like, oh, did I do it? Like, or, or, you know, what we hear from a lot of people is that after a, situ you know, after a situation happens, people go home and they're like replaying the situation and wondering, wondering, you know, did I, did I do the thing? Um, what did that, you know, what did that facial expression mean? What did that, what does that silence mean? Um, you know, all of it, because those are that, those were all like survival strategies. Um, if you've had an access need to be, picking up on all these cues because you're interacting with people who don't mean what they say and say what they mean. And it looks like that's resonating with Amy also. Jack says there's gonna, a certain, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Sylvia. Sorry, I was just gonna jump in and say, I, I've been finding more and more that there's 
I'm, I'm not being told. And I haven't been told. And I find that like toddlers where they parallel play, I just find myself parallel playing through life and I don't know. And then I wonder why, well, I didn't get invited to this party and I didn't, you know, and you see it on Facebook or you see, oh, they all went there, but I wasn't given the go because I, I, you know, I may have said something or I may have done something or I may have not done something or, you know, but, but, not, but nobody says anything. No one will tell you. So you have, you have no way of knowing. Right. You have no way of knowing or so, 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 so it's, you know, all of those examples you gave Cynthia that resonates with me so much throughout my life and the ghosting of like people just disappearing of like, you don't know why, I guess it was something I said and did, but you still don't know why. And so you don't know like what to not repeat, but like, maybe you would repeat it anyway, because maybe that person's just not your person and you know, all of it. Sierra. Your, your sound's not connecting. It's doing the thing with your headphone. There you go. Sorry, that was my fault. Um, <laughs> I think that ties back for me to what you were saying about the uh, goal of not being a burden for people. I know working in hospice, that was like the most common goal for people was I don't want to be a burden to my family. And if you talk to the family, they're like, oh no, of course we want to keep this person at home. We want to take care of them. That's our goal. And that, that disconnect because people don't always say what they mean. It's that disconnect of... Oh, people aren't telling me that I'm doing something wrong, but people also aren't telling me that they want to help take care of me or they want to help be in this interdependent relationship with me. Yes, right. All of that. I'm going to catch up in the chat. Um, Jack says, there's a certain hypocrisy in pushing the idea of independence, given how many spaces are not accessible um, and uh there's a link, link in the chat about um, an example of inaccessibility, but there are several articles that talk about accessibility and who is able to move independently through society, right? Move independently through society, right? It's, it's yeah, um, I agree with that. Um, I don't know if like, you know, the, the, I mean, it's, 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 it's multiple messages that don't, um, I think really acknowledge the idea that it's not like that access is so much more than doing the thing, like, like being accessible does not mean doing the thing by yourself. And I think that often it's referred to that those things like that, that's like how accessibility is defined, but it depends. Um, so uh, to push independence while not also pushing for a truly accessible society is baffling, right? So both of those, so what I said, and that's not the angle you took it, I'm sorry for like um, commenting before reading the second part of your question, both of those things are true. Um, so so in, in what world are, do we have, you know, the toddlers growing up, you know, being getting, getting those over rehearsed neural pathways of like, oh, you did the thing by yourself, yay, you, you peed by yourself, yay. Like, but, but, but we're not, we're not also um, questioning um, how so many members of our community cannot have full and meaningful participation of all the things. Um, I'm, and, and I'm going to come back to David's question because um, maybe Christine is going to answer it. We'll see. Um, I think the key to really understand your nervous system and what puts it out of its threshold, right? So essentially to know your access needs, access needs being what anyone needs for full and meaningful participation. We all have access needs, regardless of you know what type of brain we have. Um, so, um, if that happens, like when the trigger comes, essentially, um, that requires help that requires support that requires maybe, maybe co-regulation, maybe, you know, some, some involvement from another nervous system. Same for our kids. If we have them having a PDA kid means that they really need me to not be involved in things sometimes, but I still need to monitor their threshold of tolerance and let them know I will help them when they need it. And it's such a balance and so complicated for all of us. Um, and, you know, I can say as the parent of a pda -er, um, my pda -er is um, is the opposite. Like PDA is not even, you know, a, a, a homogenous group. You know, my pda -er needs 
my nervous system to co-regulate at all times um, or someone's nervous system doesn't need to be mine. It's, it's actually not usually mine. Um, but, but anyway, um, I, I think what I want to, when I, I want to come back to David's question, um, asking about what's involved in co-regulating our nervous systems. Um, a great book that I, uh, I, I, I recommend for a, like a, a, a really, um, I think, comprehensive look at co-regulation is self-reg by Stuart Shanker um, and talks about how beef, um, you know there's things in your environment that are going to impact it. There are things in the you know um, the physical cues, emotional cues, cognitive cues, social cues, and these cues are going to either stress you out, stress your nervous system out, um, or um, or, or, or be soothing to your nervous system. And so when we say regulated, we're not necessarily talking about being calm. Regulated doesn't mean calm. It means just that you have, avail you, you have access to your cortex. Um, and so, you know, whether that's calm or not, um, it's that when your limbic system is triggered, um, you don't have full access to the thinking part of your brain, to the cortex. Um, it's, it's taken offline. Um, and so in early childhood, um, Dr. Shanker describes the concept of the interbrain, the idea that the infant and the parent um, like essentially share a nervous system. And so that when the infant's nervous system is impacted by the cues, it's the it's like 100% dependent on the parent's nervous system to give cues of safety regulation. Well, um, what I can tell you is that as the as the parent of a former infant, um, I didn't do that because I was so dysregulated by my infant's dysregulation um, because it was like this, the loudest sound I'd ever heard in my entire life, right? And that like, I felt like my brain was on fire. I didn't know anything about my own brain. I didn't know anything about regulation. I just knew that my brain was going to explode. And so I'm cueing unsafety at the time in which the infant's feeling unsafe, right? So like that's, that happens like so much, like so much. And so, you know, now I have a narrative for that, but like back then I felt really shameful about that. So anyway, Dr. Shanker then further describes that um, as um, uh, a, a, a kind of the bridge between interbrain and self-regulation is the idea of co-regulation, which is that two nervous systems impact each other. They interact for good or for bad. Um, and so, you know, if I'm in a space and um, someone else is dysregulated, um, I, if I have access to my cortex, I might be able to use my cortex to plan a strategy for supporting that person, whether it's my child or my patient or my friend or whomever. Um, if I don't have access to my cortex, um, I, my energy in that, in, in that dyad may actually make the person's dysregulation worse. That happened this morning in my house. So um, it's, 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 it's about just sort of acknowledging that nervous systems are interacting at all times. There can be co-regulation, there can be co-dysregulation. Um, and it's, uh, um, anyway, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for, 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 uh, for, for the me too. I always love a good me too. <laughs> So as it relates to, thank you, Alicia. So that sounds like that's uh, resonating with Alicia also. Um, and I, 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 I think um, interdependence from a regulation piece um, is, is, is really a, a topic we should, we should be thinking and talking about. So, you know, young kids, like elementary school kids are already receiving the message in you know preschool right of like you should be able to self-regulate you should be able to you know make yourself calm sit down do the thing um without like acknowledging the brain science around co-regulation and the brain science around co-dysregulation you got lots of nervous systems in a space um 
at any given time, if there's like 30 nervous systems in a room, what are the odds that everyone's going to be regulated? Like zero, right? Um, I know a lot. I, I know several of you are educators. Um, anyway, uh, so so just just sort of thinking through that. So like in in my house, when there's like three nervous systems in a room and there's chaos, like what the heck does that mean for classrooms full of sweet little loves? Plus a plus an educator who likely um is not having their access needs met, and you know can't eat, can't drink, can't you know, let alone like sensory processing and cognitive demands and like all of it. And then that's the norm. That's the norm of like, look around, everyone else is doing the thing. Everyone else is like sitting down. Like, why are your feelings so big? You're too much. You're so much. Suck it up, get it together. And, you know, decades of over-rehearsed neural pathways. Then as an adult, you're impacted by a cue from your environment, have a big response. And then what? It's the, it's, it's, it's that, that, that internalized narrative of like, I'm too much. I shouldn't be doing this. I should be able to be calm or, you know, and, 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 and that, that plays out in, you know, whether someone is a parent and has that narrative of like, I should be calm because grownups are calm. Um, like, that that needs to be unlearned um or you know um uh i, I flipped my lid at work um i'm not supposed to do that because grown-ups are supposed to be calm um yeah that needs to be unlearned it's like well you wouldn't have flipped your lid if your access needs were met so what what do you, what what do we do um are there are there nervous systems in our environments who can be dependent upon when, of course, they have access to their cortex um, for co-regulation and like the co-regulate, like interdependence and co-regulation, I think are, you know, like really inter interrelated concepts. Um, and I just want to want to create a little space uh, for 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 folks we haven't heard from yet. If if you want to share about how this conversation is landing on your brain. It's funny, I was so dysregulated at Brain Club, having nothing to do with Brain Club, just having to do with like flood and, you know, everything um, that I like, for those of you who were there, I like, and, the, and like the technology got messed up. It was like a whole thing. Anyway, so I like, stop really being able to coherently speak with mouth words. And so I just like didn't talk. And it was, there were lots of nervous systems who gave feedback around like, that actually really worked for me. Cause it was like, there was spaciousness that I could enter the conversation. So anyway, I'd love to try to create that without being dysregulated myself. Not by the silence. I'm not dysregulated by silence. I love silence. Um, I just, uh, I forget to create it. Thanks, Nita. So Nita says it's such a huge step forward for us recently um, to get to having some ability to co-regulate with our nine-year-old PDA or a lot of people. And when I said Nita, I meant Nita and David. I know you're both both, both contributing to the sentiment. Um, a lot of people don't understand how much it can take to get there. I'm sure someday he'll be able to do more independently. Um, but I know that that's not going to happen until we've had a good long stretch about of co-regulating. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and Alicia says, I'm a talker and I learned so much about leaving space from that brink. Oh, that's awesome. Um, Elizabeth's wondering about from a medical or developmental standpoint, are there people who never get to self-regulation? That's an interesting question. Um, I think that I think that would be really hard to answer in like a pure like vacuum sense, because I think that um like what's going on in the environment, um, you know, even someone with robust self-regulation skills may not always be able to access them. Like you can have the skill, but not be able to access it because you don't have access to your cortex. If in fact, and we talk a lot about this with our patients, 
there are and and you can um i i, I will um i'll pull up in the chat there's a brain club from october of 2022 uh, where our guest presenter was hannah bloom um, occupational therapist on our board of directors talking about like top down regulation um self-regulation skills like you think your way through the regulation like cognitively reframing like i can i can do hard things like mantras like that or you know that thought that i'm having it's 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 unhelpful so i can change the way i'm thinking about that and now i have a different emotional response those are top down strategies and a lot of us overly rely on top down strategies um bottom up so like um uh in your body um can you know connected to brain um a lot of us didn't grow up learning those or practicing those and so when top down regulation fails we're like up a creek cuz we don't have any other skills cuz when you like like this morning for example so there's like chaos in my house and like everybody's screaming and like i have like a you know, it's it's interesting to, to to think about, like, given how dysregulated I get um, a lot of the time, like, I have actually like a robust set of self-regulation skills. It's just that I lose access to my cortex. Um, and it when I lose access to my cortex, I can't use those top-down strategies. Nobody can. Nobody can use top-down strategies when they are too far gone in the dysregulation channel. So to better answer that question around, like, are there nervous systems that, like, never reach self-regulation it, it 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 really just depends and even if, even if you like reach this um it's not like a like a one and done like it's not like a linear developmental hierarchy of like i achieved self-regulation and like now i'm good it's like i i reached self-regulation and like i need i need co-regulation like most of the day um christina says uh i also don't think as an autistic person that i self-regulate all at once yeah Sometimes it's a process like regulation in a moment, but it's like coping. I need my partner for other kinds of co-regulation. Right. And like maybe maybe you can or maybe a person can um, buy a little time with a strategy, but that's assuming the cue in the environment stops. And it doesn't often stop. So there's like that piece. Too. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Thanks for putting the link in the chat. Oh, uh, Sarah's cueing me that there's a comment that I missed. Okay, yes. Um. Oh, I think I read that. Did I read that? Did I catch up to it eventually? All right. Um. Uh. Amy's asking what my co-regulation looks like. Uh, when it works well or when it doesn't work well. Um, when it works well. All right, let me give an example. Um, so like, um, today, um, well, I, I, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll speak in generalities. Um, I have a number of people who are energetically safe bucket people so that if I am dysregulated and I have enough access to my cortex to initiate contact, um, I might like reach out because they're probably gonna give me some kind of me too and that's gonna be like a top down thing that's not my thing. Or I might, for example, um, like yesterday, yesterday Luna and I, we we had conflicting access needs and resulted uh, co-regulation. Um, uh, co-dysregulation, I mean, um, and uh, we were spending time uh, with with someone who energetically is is a safe bucket person for both of us, and just energetically, this is a bottom up, just energetically, that person being in the space at the All Brains Belong office, being at the space with us, like, was regulating nervous system to nervous system, that that co-regulation, but I'd love to hear from others about what that what co-regulation looks like for you um, when it, 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 it or not um, or 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 failed co-regulation. Any 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 of the above. I'm just also going to read Steve's comment in our self-contained classroom. 
Um, and so by self-contained classroom, for those who don't know, Steve, are you referring to a special education setting with students with high support needs who are not included in a mainstream classroom? Is that is is is, yeah. is that's yeah. how you define that? Right. Okay. Um, uh, students could repeat top-down self-regulation strategies like like a parade ground exercise, but when the actual situation came up, all bets were off. Well, that resonates with me too. Um, uh, that I have all kinds of things that like I can talk about at Brain Club, but like in the thick of it, when I don't have access to my cortex, I can't talk about anything because these are cortex things. And I think like what what I often think about is, and I see it, you know, I, I, I see it everywhere. I see it like, you know, feedback from educators about my patients. I see it in my house. Like it's, it's like often downstairs brain is held to the standards of upstairs brain. It's like a different part of the brain. The limbic system cannot be the cortex. They are different. They are separate. Sarah says, I think of co-regulation as a calming presence. Um, it doesn't always mean spoken words, but sometimes it does. I think of it like Brene Brown's breaking down of shame by sharing our story with someone we trust to feel that me too moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Christina is saying that nature is a uh, partner for co-regulation. I feel that way more connected to nature than people a lot of the time. Yeah. And I guess we often think people have to be the ones, but my dogs help too. No, I think that's so common, right? Like that's, yes. Thanks for sharing. Um, Amy says, uh, I love that you added, when I am able to reach out, sometimes that's the most difficult part to reach out. I don't know what to say when I am dysregulated and can't talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Especially, especially when for a lot of a, a, a lot of people, when we are dysregulated, we like it, it's not just the spoken communication that's hard. Um, people may have access to be able to um, to some form of AAC. Sending a text message to someone for co-regulation might might maybe they have access to that um, when they don't have access to like making a phone call or asking for help in a you know spoken communication way. Um, but but it is also like the motor planning aspect of it. It's, it's more than, it's more than like the, the, the format of communication. It's like, I am frozen. I cannot initiate anything right now. I am, I'm too shut down or I am, um, or I have a big meltdown and then I crash afterwards and then then I can't initiate anything because I'm spent, right? Like I think all of those those things are on the menu and are on the list of barriers to um, you know, making making that making that um connection. And I and as Christina's pointing out, um, so many people were isolated as children for for being dysregulated, you, you know, so you're flipping your lid, go to your room. Um, or um, um, the like, oh, you're flipping your lid, you can't act nicely, you can't behave nicely, I'm going to stop talking to you, I'm going to give you the silent treatment, the friggin' silent treatment, this is what goes on. That's, anyway, uh, yeah, timeouts are banned in my house, says Christina. Yeah, they're banned in my house too. Um, so, um, one time I saw Luna because like Luna doesn't, Luna's not, um, around a traditional education space. I saw her put her toys in timeout. I flipped my lid because like, where'd she see that? Like, where did that come from? Was it like media? Like, is there someone who's interacting with her who uses this language? Like, I mean, just like, anyway. Um, yeah. It's hard, right? Because there are, there are healthcare providers who literally teach parents to do that. Like, you know, parents come looking for help from a healthcare provider. They're, you know, they're, they're so dysregulated looking for help. And an expert tells you, this is how you do the thing. 
Um, same thing goes with like, you know, responding to all kinds of things, sleep related issues or like whatever. There's all kinds of advice from professionals that is um, not, not based on brain science um, and maybe came from a time when the brain science wasn't known and then like persisted. Um, another really great book um, is called Beyond Behaviors um, by Dr. Mona Delahook. Um, I will pull. I'll pull up a. I'll put. I'll pull a link to, to that as well. Um, Amy, I feel like I want to speak into something, which is like. Um, I don't necessarily know exactly how to say it, um, but I think when I was a child, there was so much dysregulated relation in my house. I think there's probably a lot more, you know, neurodiversity in there than anyone recognized. And there was a way that, um, that I was so overwhelmed that I overrode, but in that overriding, I would try and regulate or attune to the different people. And so I, I, it's interesting that my dysregulation became the way to try and create regulation with like, you know, and so there was like no real accurate attunement to me as a really sensitive child. And so it's been such a confusion in my life of like, what is co-regulation? Who's safe to co-regulate with? But there's also this sort of like context specific way I think I'm supposed to be in every environment which is like not dysregulation. And it's a huge part of my masking tendencies is not being able to admit or know how um, that because I uh, com completely appear to be regulated when inside it's like I'm terrified or I'm like dissociated even. And um, I just wondered if other people felt that of like in their masking tendencies, like masking dysregulation if that was a way that you can be so sensitive to your environment that um, you're you're overwhelmed, but you could actually be be causing regulation for other people in your environment. Yeah, that resonates with me. And Kat has said in the chat that that's resonating with Kat also. Um, and, uh, and Christine is also agreeing. Alicia says, in my family, we experience the dynamic of competing access needs. When one partner loses ability to communicate or initiate, and the other partner feels trauma triggered by disconnection and feeling of distance. Oh, that resonates with me like so much. Cynthia, did I see a hand? I did. I'm you? just not, I'm not a fast typer. So I was, <laughs> yeah, and no, I don't go for it. I don't want to keep talking, but it's, it's I, I'm not that fast. Um, yeah. So, so growing up, I had a very boisterous family and I was adopted into it. So I was already kind of, you know, different and then having all the sensory stuff going on, but I was kind of trained or training myself to fit in and to blend and to be part of this, this you know, very loud family, but I just needed to, you know, kind of get away. And now as an adult talking about the masking, I feel like a chameleon where I can go into these different, you know, spaces and become what that space is. And then, but then I have to like, oh, I'm having a panic attack. Uh, hello. I'm not really supposed to be here. <laughs> I need to remove myself. So, you know, like I was invited to go a movie but I can't go now because this movie theater is not listening to you know they need to turn the volume down so I'm like I, I I'm finally able to say okay that was dysregulating for me I can't do it I'm missing out on the social piece that I desperately need but I have to choose myself first so like they're they're like the layers of the masking and um that kind of chameleon thing that that I find happens from having that um family background. Yes. Right. There are so many people who upon as adults starting to learn about their brains, um, they identify that the face they put out into the world um, is, is masking. Um, and there were, there, there were also times where that 
strategy, which for many people is involuntary, subconscious, it just happens, um, to, to produce that chameleon, um, you know, s- seeming adaptability, there are people who derive a lot of pride from, from, from that. And then that can be really disorienting for people when they're like, oh, that, that, that's masking. Um, oh, um, like what, what am I, if not my mask? Kat says, I masked as a wonderful listener because I was actually mute. So dysregulated. Yeah, I learned to go with it and just nod and look like I was listening intently. Yeah. Sierra. I think, um, I just want to say, Amy, that really resonated with me too. And I think, I think that's one of the reasons why it's, I don't know, super common, but um, it can be fairly common for neurodivergent people to be pretty good at working in high stress situations where you're regulating other people's emotions. Um, I'm thinking like working in an ER is generally full of lots of neurodivergent people. Um, and it's because you're a lot of times you're really good at learning to mask in situations where everybody else is dysregulated and you've learned to be able to be the only one who's calm and regulated and be that regulating presence for other people. Yeah. Um, and there are also many nervous systems who work in environments like that where they the mask is to appear calm and cool and collected and so good at regulating the people, but like inside your brain's gonna explode. Um, so like, yeah, yeah, that was me. Um, so yeah, so there's that also. And then you get home and explode it, or you get yes. home and explode it to everybody else. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, But then back to that narrative of like, you should be able to regulate, you know, you're a grown up, what's wrong with you, you need, you know, anyway, all of that, as opposed to your access needs were not met, your limbic system felt unsafe, and you, yeah, the word should comes up a lot, as Sarah says in the chat, exactly, and so like when we think about, um, uh, I'll, 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 I'll save my point because I won't forget it because uh, Sarah's got my visual support for me. Weston. Um, I guess it would be an interesting time to chime in to say that um, I, I grew up as the kid of a doctor who was one of the, he was an ER uh, surgeon at, for a lot of my childhood. And he was that type sort of regulated person. And I've, as an adult, I've, and even since coming into ABB, I've started recognizing that he has a lot of ADD characteristics, um, just as a personality and even the way he, his thoughts are structured. And I'm even just in this conversation recognizing like, oh, uh, he was, he was what we're talking about. He's this sort of uh, always in control. Like he actually is the person you want to be with (laughs) in an emergency because he has such a great uh, sense of control and command, but I'm also kind of tying this to uh, Amy's comment as Amy's husband, you know, and and as in the conversation about co-regulation and sort of the symmetry of my tendency to sort of have an environmental need for calmness (laughs) and you know, sometimes the way that that interacts with Amy's need to actually express outwardly and this, the symmetry of her dysregulation actually activating my dysregulator feeling like in an unsafe environment. And so sometimes that's like, that's probably the central challenge in our relationship around co-regulation, because I think when either one of us are really well-regulated, we both do a good job of co-regulating and even recognizing Oh, maybe, you know, one or the other of us are in a better position to to be the supportive partner and the other one being in the need, um, having a need. But when we're both under times of stress and that um, that breaks down, you know, like I have a need to be in a space with a, you know, a non-emotional kind of space. And, you know, she might have a need to be in a very emotional space or maybe sometimes vice versa. But um, I do think it's 
I'm just, I guess I'm just saying that as a general thought, uh, connecting a lot of different parts of my life <laughs> into the idea of regulation and co-regulation. So that's all. Wes and I have chills. I have chills. I am having a real emotional response to your reflection. Like this is why we do brain club. This is, this is why we do this because the whole idea is that when you develop an awareness around your own access needs, um, let alone the access needs of other people, um, that is what allows you to have full and meaningful relationships, right? Because I think what we see a lot is that we have people who are like, you know, they, they start learning about their access needs, they realize that a lot of their needs are not met, they, you know, maybe have some language to describe it, but then the person they're trying to interact with all day does not have awareness, does not have the awareness of their own needs. Um, it's, 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 so a lot of people will come and they'll be like, you know, even in our, in our medical practice, they'll come and they'll be like, you know, how do I explain this thing to my partner? I'm like, well, well we need to have the partner learn about their own brain. Mm. Um, Amy. Um, just to, to respond to that, it's what's interesting to me is that Weston is the first safe person in my entire life to actually be able to express. And so it's been interesting to like explore what is the impact that my expression, because I, I, I need to, find it and I need to be able to scream like I am not the problem like I can't be the problem and Weston's like but if you're screaming that at me I can't like help you like I'm losing you know like I'm losing ground and and to recognize there is a side effect to the emotionality and how big it gets and not that we'll always be perfect but there it, it's just ironic that like Weston literally is the per the, the first person that I actually felt like I could say what was my interior world was and so it has been just this kind of roller coaster of, of how to, how to, that ABB is the first time that I've actually realized fully that Weston can start expressing, like, I have access need here. I actually literally cannot do this with you. I have to totally opt out. And I'm like, you know, and so we've had to then come back, but it's, it's so helpful to have a community where we get to start learning through other people's experiences and then start saying like oh that's that's how we are and I want to not be the one that's like the loud person <laughs> but um but I I am so I want to own that here you know Amy thank you so much and you know I really appreciate um both Amy and Weston you sharing sharing your perspectives on on the same situation I think that's just like it's amazing to watch that um because that's 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 what's possible, and I think that um you know as as uh, when two people have self self awareness, um, then you while you both have access to your cortex, you you have an opportunity to zoom out and make a plan for negotiating the conflicting access needs the next time it happens because it will happen again. It will keep happening. It's really like when both parties have access to their cortex, um, then, then, then all things are possible. Both parties have access to their cortex and awareness of their needs. That's the recipe for like moving forward when those ingredients are not met. Um, it, 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 it's, it's really very hard. And there's several, several comments in the, in, in the chat, um, you know, really appreciating you sharing your story and feeling less alone in, 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 um, in hearing what you've, uh, the beautiful vulnerability that, that you've demonstrated. So, you know, I think that um, that's, that's, that's a, a, a really nice segue into um, next, next brain club. Actually, I'm gonna, before I speak out of, out of turn, I want to make sure that it's actually, yeah, it's, it's actually exactly, exactly next week. So it is, um, Communicating and negotiating your access needs. How perfect. Um, so thank you all so much for being part of this. What I thought was an amazing conversation. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.